Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast, where I seek truth in the world's best books. I'm your host, Eric Rostad, coming to you from the beautiful Books of Titans studio in Franklin, Tennessee. My goal is to read 52 books per year and share what I'm learning. I'll talk a bit about each book, tie ideas together from a variety of genres, and share the one thing I always hope to remember from each book. Today, I'm going to cover Promises to Keep by Joe Biden. This is book 37 of 52 for my 2020 reading list. This episode is part of a special series I'm doing where I'm reading a book by or about each of the four main candidates for president and vice president. I then cover each candidate on the podcast in the following order. The first episode on October 9th covered Kamala Harris. The second episode, October 16th, was Donald Trump. Today, Joe Biden. And then next week, October 30th, will be Mike Pence. And I will also talk about the libertarian candidate, Joe Jorgensen. The election is on Tuesday, November 3rd. I'm going to make as much of an effort as possible to not use any outside information in these episodes. I'm presenting what I learned from this book, not what I learned from the news or from friends and family or other sources. This episode will be very similar to the other episodes about Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, and my goal is to present the content in such a way that you cannot tell who I favor. So here's the breakdown of this episode. First segment will be personal details about Joe Biden. Second segment will be professional details. Third segment, top three policy stances, as well as some quotes. And then segment four, the one thing, the the main thing that stuck out to me about Joe Biden. I chose to to read Promises to Keep by, by Joe Biden even though it was written 12 years ago. This was written in the run-up to the 2008 election, and at the point that he wrote this, he was a a candidate for the president. So he became Obama's vice presidential candidate, but but at this point, he was running for the job of, of president. So... you, it, it's an interesting take because it's before he knew that he would be uh, on the vice president ticket. And it's also, he, Joe wrote a, a book more recently called Promise Me Dad, but that was about his son, Bo, who passed away from brain cancer in 2015. So that I knew that book would be more about that story and not as much about his life and his policies and his professional life. So despite this book being 12 years old, I wanted more of that. I wanted more of the the background story and, and about his life. And so this, this book was the right choice. Um, and you know, a lot's happened since he wrote this book, but for the purposes of this episode and comparing the candidates, this, this was going to be the best book. I, I also want to, uh, highlight that this was the longest of the four books that I read by the candidates. Uh, it's an extensive look at Biden's life, both pr- personal and professional and his time in the Senate. So to get started on his on his personal personal details, he was born in 1942, which puts him in the silent generation. It puts him at the very end of it and and some may have him as a a boomer depending on the on the delineation of the of the years there. But let's let's go with the delineation that is in the book Generations that I covered uh, in a previous podcast episode. The the thing that stuck out to me in that book is that we have never had a president from the silent generation. Silent generation is people who are born from 1925 to 1942. We've had plenty of candidates, but we have never, ever had a president from the silent generation. And I just find that fascinating. We had seven presidents from the previous generation, the GI generation, and we've had three, uh, potentially four, if, if uh, depending on the year breakdown again, from the boomer generation. Uh, some put Obama in the Gen X, some put him in boomer, but uh, Clinton, Bush, and uh, Trump are all in the in the um, boomer generation. Biden's parents were Joe, Joseph Biden, uh, who was born in Baltimore in 1915. He saw both good times and bad times uh, in, in, in terms of work. Uh, so they, they lived quite well and they lived... Uh, not 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 as well. Uh, but through all that time, Joe Biden saw his father working working very hard. His mother was Jean Finnegan, and his father and mother married in May of 1941. They had Joe a year later in 1942. Uh, Joe Biden went to high school at Archmere, which is in Delaware. And in 
his sophomore year, he was the class representative. And then in his junior and senior years, he was the class president. The thing that really stuck out in his early life is that he had a stutter. And he worked very hard to overcome that stutter. He had a very proud moment when he gave the welcome at his high school graduation uh, and did not stutter through the through that uh, welcome. He did undergrad work at the University of Delaware in political science and history, and then he went to law school at Syracuse University College. I, I find it interesting that uh, Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, and Mike Pence were all lawyers before getting into, into politics. Biden opened up a law office, and he uh, he also became a public defender. That was his first his first role. He met N- uh, Nelia Hunter in 1964, and he makes a, a nice reference to The Great Gatsby, which I'll read because The Great Gatsby was on my list this year, and, and this stuck out to me. Over her shoulder, I caught a glimpse through the leaded glass of the lake. Soft light sparkled from the docks on the other side. I felt like Fitzgerald's Gatsby. Only my vision, my dream was standing right there within reach. They got married in 1966, and they had Bo Biden in 1969. One year later, Hunter in 1970, and then a year later, Naomi in 1971. In 1972, shortly after Biden was elected to the Senate, his wife Nelia was driving with all three children in the car to get a Christmas tree. Joe was in D.C. hiring staff. He had just, uh, after his election to the Senate, and there was an accident. His wife and baby girl, Naomi, were killed, and Bo and Hunter were also in the car, and they had serious injuries that kept them in the hospital for for quite a, quite a while. Um, Biden took six months to grieve, uh, take care of his sons who were, who were recovering and, uh, just to get his life back, back together. And then he went to, uh, to serve his term as Senator in 1977, he married Jill Jacobs. And in 1981, they had a daughter named Ashley in 1998. He sought the presidential nomination of which I'll say more in the next section in his professional life. But, uh, around this time, um, he started getting headaches and later discovered that he had an aneurysm. And I'm going to read the sections of, um, of the book about his aneurysm because this is, this is amazing and, and one of the things I did not know about Biden. There was blood in my spinal fluid, which meant I had an artery somewhere in my head that was already leaking blood. After a, a CT scan and an aneogram, the doctor who explained the results of the combined tests looked worried. I had an aneurysm lying just below the base of my brain. I wasn't sure exactly what aneurysm meant, but doctors have a direct and simple analogy for explaining the malady. They told me to think of my artery as an inner tube inflated inside an old bicycle tire. When a spot on the inner tube thins, it weakens and begins to bulge. Air can begin to leak out or it can burst. Mine had already leaked, and that's what had knocked me out in Rochester the night before. It might have accounted for the episode in Nashua nearly a year before. I was lucky to be alive, but if the aneurysm bled again, I probably wouldn't survive. The size of the worst bulge in the leak meant that a fatal rebleed could be imminent. Surgery to shore up the spot where I'd bled was the best chance I had of survival, but the procedure I'd need was delicate. The microsurgical craniotomy Dr. George was about to perform on me was delicate and fairly extensive. George would have to open up my head, lift my brain slightly, and travel through the thin space cont- containing the c- cerebrospinal fluid between my skull and my brain, all just to get to the aneurysm lying deep beneath the base of the brain. Once there, he would carefully expose and dissect all the small arteries until he found the tiny berry-like aneurysm surrounded by a small clot. After gently dissecting the aneurysm, the neurosurgeon would then place a tiny metal spring clip to occlude the neck of the aneurysm permanently, while being careful to allow for normal blood flow through the adjacent artery. Dr. George explained that the second, smaller aneurysm was unlikely to burst anytime soon, so he would leave that for another operation weeks later. When he finished explaining the procedure, I asked George about the chances in the first surgery. The reason I read that whole, uh, that's the end of the quote there. The reason I read that whole thing was just to describe what, what happened in, in 
it was amazing to hear that they had to they had to cut his head open and then lift his brain up and then not just do that once but twice so he had two of these surgeries and there was obviously a lot of of potential for for danger and and memory loss and and all sorts of things but uh he he went through that surgery twice in 1988 and in between those two surgeries he had a a clot in his lung and had to, to be in the hospital for another extended period of time so all this going on uh in in 1998 um when he was thinking that he would be running for president uh, fast forward a few years later to 2015, and as I mentioned earlier, his son, Bo Biden, passed away. That is an awful lot of suffering for for one life, and uh, it was... Now in a segment two in the professional details about Joe Biden... Biden got into law because he picked up a congressional directory, uh, I think in high school, and he saw that almost everyone in there was a lawyer. So he thought that would be the the quickest way to get it to, to become a congressman. Well, in 1970, he became a member of the county council in Newcastle in Delaware. And then in 1972, he ran for senator of the state of Delaware, and he ran against the incumbent Senator Boggs. And Senator Boggs had been a senator for many years, so Boggs just kind of thought he had the nomination in the bag. He, he didn't really go back to Delaware to, to campaign. He just kind of stayed in D.C. doing his work. And so Biden was out there meeting as many people as he could. He was running these uh, with his, his family members. He was running uh, these coffee um, events where, where he would just go to try to meet as many people as he could. And that he would go from like coffee, neighborhood coffee event to neighborhood coffee event to neighborhood coffee event throughout the entire day. And so he just worked his butt off and, and met as many people as he could and ended up winning that election. But he was 29 years old when he won. So he, when he won, he couldn't even get sworn in because you have to be 30 to be a senator. So he turned 30 on November 20th of that year. And then uh, he, he was able to, uh, to, get, to get sworn in. But uh, November 20th was his birthday. And then uh, the following month, December, is when the tragic accident happened and, and his wife and daughter were killed. In 1997, he announced that he want, he would be a candidate for the Democratic presidential nomination for 1998. And during the preparation, uh, or during, yeah, during the preparation, he gave this speech. Just wanted to read a section of it. To my generation has now come the challenge. In the days to come, we'll, we will be tested on whether we have the moral courage, the realism, the idealism, the tenacity, and the ability to sacrifice some of the current comfort to invest in the future. I believe that this generation will rise to the challenge. The experts believe that, like the Democratic Party itself, the less than 40-year-old voters are prepared to sell their souls for some security, real or illusory. They have misjudged us. Just because our political heroes were murdered does not mean that the dream does not still live, buried deep in our broken hearts. End quote. At this time, he was also chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and he played a key role in the Supreme Court nomination hearings for Robert Bork. This dug into his time of being able to to go out and campaign, and he also started getting plagiarism charges in the media. Uh, the New York Times was 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 harping on that pretty strong, and then he started getting these headaches that led to the eventual um, diagnosis of of the aneurysm. So he he got out of the race, um, and then had those surgeries the the following year in in 1998. By the end of this book, we we see that Joe Biden is going to run for president again, and that is for 2008. And at this point, uh, when this book was written, he did not yet know that uh, he was not going to be president, uh, but that he would be vice president under Obama. Other than that, for, for pre- professional details, I thought it'd be best to just read a section from the introduction, because this highlights a lot of what he has been involved in in his time in the Senate. And and furthermore, in, in, in his life, as a United States senator, I've watched and played some small part in history, the Vietnam War, Watergate, the Iran hostage crisis, the Bork nomination, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the reunification of Germany, the disintegration of the Soviet Union, 
9-11, two wars in Iraq, a presidential impeachment, a presidential resignation, and a presidential election decided by the Supreme Court. I've been in war zones across the world and have seen genocide up close. I've sat face-to-face -face for hard talks with Kosygin, Gaddafi, Helmut Schmidt, Sadat, Mubarak, and Milosevic. I've seen Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Clinton, and two Bushes wrestle with the presidency. I ran my own race for president and had to pick up the pieces after the train wreck, then nearly died from a cranial aneurysm. In the aftermath, I had to remake my health, my reputation, and my career in the Senate. The years since then have been the most rewarding. I count my role in helping to end genocide in the Balkans and in securing the passage of the Violence Against Women Act as my proudest moments in public life. If I had accomplished nothing else, and if I accomplish nothing more, for, for me, those two efforts redeem every second of difficulty and doubt in my long career. End quote. So Biden first got to D.C. in 1973 as a senator, and he was a senator until 2009 when he, he became vice president. Now, in a segment three and some different policy and beliefs that Biden has, along with some uh, quotes at the very end of this segment. So the first I'm calling his common thread, and I'm going to read uh, a lot of different sections in, in this uh, segment. With power and privilege, I was taught, comes a responsibility to treat others with respect and fairness. Generosity is not simply a virtue, it's a commandment. And when we see people abusing power, it's our duty to intercede on behalf of their victims. From civil rights and voting rights to my inter interest in putting police on the streets to protect people from violent criminals in their own neighborhoods, to stopping banks from redlining practices that made it nearly impossible for people living in black neighborhoods to get loans, to pushing for federal guidelines that made criminal sentencing more fair and uniform, to fighting violence against children, to the disgust I felt watching Richard Nixon and J. Edgar, Edgar Hoover abuse their high offices. Uh, in, in parentheses, he says, I was one of the few senators who voted against naming the FBI building after Hoover, end parentheses, to the fight against the drug cartels in the 1980s. There was a single common thread. As I looked back on my career, it was obvious that, that what had always animated me was the belief that we should stand up to those who abused power, whether it was political, economic, or physical, end quote. Again, the common thread, as I looked back on my career, it was obvious that what had always animated me was the belief that what we should stand up to, that we should stand up to those who abused power, whether it was political, economic, or physical. And then two things that, that he, that he mentions as, as being part of this thread are his role in, in stopping the, the war in the Balkans. He, he went to, to meet Milosevic. He met some of the other, the other leaders um, he w had discussed for Milosevic and, and came back to Clinton and told him all that was going on. Uh, it took a while. Uh, they, they eventually um, tried to stop the um, Milosevic going against against Kosovo, and and Biden uh, describes his role in that. The other thing that he's that Biden's very proud of is the Violence Against Women Act. And what's interesting is that was. He, he fought so hard for this, and it was so important to him that um, to get it passed, he had to vote for the crime bill. And so the crime bill and the Violence Against Women Act were coupled together. And he gets a lot of heat for, for voting for the crime bill. Um, but the, the Violence Against Women Act was, was one of his main things he was fighting for, and, and, and those two things were, were put together. The second policy or belief issue that I want to highlight is that of abortion. And I'm going to read different passages of what he says about that. Well, my position is that I personally am opposed to abortion, but I don't think I have the right to impose my view on something I accept as a matter of faith on the rest of society. I've thought a lot about it, and my position probably, probably doesn't please anyone. I think the government should stay out completely. I will not vote to overturn the court's decision. I will not vote to curtail a woman's right to choose abortion, but I will also not vote to use federal funds to fund abortion. And then at the very end, I've stuck to my middle of the road position on abortion for more than 30 years. I still vote against partial birth abortion and federal funding, and I'd like to find ways to make it easier for scared young mothers to choose not to have an abortion. But I will also vote against a constitutional amendment that strips a woman of her right to make her own choice. That position has earned me the distrust of some women's groups and the outright enmity of the right to life groups. End quote. The final one I want to highlight is law and order. 
on page 239, he says this, there have been some times when my Democratic colleagues have thought I've gone too far over to the side of the police in law and order issues, but I've always felt that the public safety and security is the first duty of government. A government must ensure safe homes, streets, schools, and public places before it can fulfill any other promises. So I was constantly watching the crime statistics for anomalies and new problems. For example, the jump in violence that accompanied the crack ep epidemic that ravaged the inner cities in the 1980s. End quote. The reason I highlight this one is he said that over and over that he, he, he considers the first duty of a government to provide safety and security. And that came from a lot of his travels as well as he was going to, the, to these different places and seeing that a war-torn land, you, you couldn't do much else if, uh, if there wasn't security in place. And he, he mentioned a lot when he talked about uh, the Iraq, Iraq war and, and, and in, in Afghanistan as well as just if there wasn't the security there, if there wasn't the law and order, then you couldn't do the, the other things. And so that's why I highlight that just because he said it over and over. So now I just want to read a few other quotes from, from the book, things that, that stuck out to me. Some of these are things that he, he heard other people say, and then some of them are, are things that, that uh, he said. But this first one comes from, um, from a senator, I believe, uh, East Eastland, and, and it starts this. He goes, another day I asked Eastland what the most significant change he'd seen in his time in Washington. Air conditioning, he said. Huh? Air conditioning, Joe. He said, used to be we'd be out on the Senate floor and along about April, the sun would start beating down and heat up that chamber to about 140 degrees. So we just go up, up and going home. Then they'd put on the air conditioning. So now we stay in Washington all year round and really mess up the country. End quote. It's pretty funny. Next one. I remember an early meeting with Prime Minister Golda Meir. Where, where she could see my despair at the prospects for peace and security for Israel. I found her bucking me up, but also giving me an unforgettable lesson in the strength and weakness of the Israeli position. We Jews have a secret weapon in our struggle against the Arabs, Meir told me. We have nowhere else to go, end quote. The next one is Biden's view on the role of government. A funny thing happened on the way to finding that argument. It opened up to me to new ways of thinking about my own long-held po political beliefs. At base, my argument with Bork was about the role of government itself. Bork and his, his adherents thought it should get out of the way and let society and the markets operate as they pleased. I thought government was obligated to be active in helping its citizens. I thought government should serve people. The conservatives could sneer about social engineering if they wanted, but I thought most people believed, as I did, that government should embody our best hopes and lend a hand to people who were struggling. End quote. After that, civil rights... When a right reaches the status and categorization of a civil right, it means the nation has arrived at a consensus that it is non-negotiable. Another one, how do you prove a negative? I think I understood for the first time why you, United States senators could sit around that same conference table and decide it wasn't worth trying to stop Hitler in 1935. I could never understand how they could just sit there knowing that they knew about the German military buildup and not act but I had the benefit of hindsight. If we'd acted in 1935, it probably would have cost 1,000 American lives, and in 1937, maybe 5,000. But what would those senators have proved? How do you prove a negative? Could they have proved they'd stopped World War II? Could they have asserted they had saved 6 million Jews, gypsies, and other, other undesirables from the Nazi death camps? Who would believe it? End quote. Next one on division. This comes towards the end of the book. What makes the partisanship so debilitating is that it's not confined to one party, and despite what so many pundits say, it's much more than a political tool to win an election. It has shaped our culture and our na national dialogue. We've lost our ability to disagree without being disagreeable, and to argue substance without questioning the basic decency of the people on the other side of the line. The partisanship rips at the bonds of affection that tie the country state to state, political party to political party, citizen to citizen. End quote. And then the last one, this comes in a, in a meeting where uh, Joe Biden is about to take over an office of a departing, departing senator. Good, good, he said, and he began to rant, run his hand back and forth across the smooth, polished mahogany. You see this table, Joe? 
This table was the flagship of the Confederacy from 1954 to 1968. We sat here, most of us from the Deep South, the old Confederacy, and we planned the demise of the Civil Rights Movement, and we lost. And Joe, now it's time that this table go to the possession of a man who was, a, who was against civil rights to a man who was for civil rights. I wasn't sure what to say, so I got up and thanked him, and I, I moved to the door. Senator Stennis said, and Joe, one more thing. The civil rights movement did more to free the white man than the black man. He could see me looking at him, confused, and he pounded on his chest. It freed my soul, he said. It freed my soul. Now into segment four and the one thing. Now I went into this project of, of reading these four books about each of the candidates with an embarrassingly low amount of knowledge about any of the candidates. Didn't matter if they were Republican or Democrat. I knew the I knew the things that were said about them. I knew things that would be highlighted on the news, uh, but I, I didn't know much about their lives at all. And so the thing that stuck out to me most about this book about Joe Biden is just the amount of history that he's been involved in. Uh, I, I think it hit in that quote earlier in segment two, where I, where I just read from from his introduction. I mean, he met with Milosevic, he met with with Gaddafi, he met with all these different different leaders uh, from from before communism, after communism, um, during major wars that 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 we've experienced during our lifetime. He he's been to Afghanistan, he's been to Iraq, he's been there during nine different presidents. And he highlights this in this experience in in his in this book, and it was just interesting. I, I, I'm I'm fascinated by these kind of, of books anyway, where where you see someone's life weaving through all these different these different experiences and these different points of of history. Uh, I I read recently the book about David David Crockett, and and again, there's so much of American history happening through his life. So just to view it from some some per, one person's life. Uh, had a similar thing that that stuck out to me throughout this book is just the amount of history that he's been involved in, in in his life and as a senator. So to recap, I, I hope you got to know Joe Biden a little bit more. Next week, I'll be covering Mike Pence, and we'll try to keep a similar format. I'll also talk a little bit about Joe Jorgensen, the libertarian candidate. That's going to do it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at eric at booksoftitans.com. Let me know what you thought of this episode or, or the other ones. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so at booksoftitans.com forward slash support. You can follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter at Books of Titans. And the website is stock full of resources to help you find the best books and to create your own reading list. I'll be back next week discussing Mike Pence and Joe Jorgensen in the final episode of this series of four episodes covering candidates. Until then, keep reading, keep learning, keep listening. I'm out. Mm-hmm.